That's good enough. Well, there's a, there's a rule in addition to expropriation, a rule called fair and equitable treatment in these international investment agreements. And many tribunals, these ad hoc arbitrators that are appointed to make decisions, have decided that what fair and equitable means is governments have an obligation to provide a stable and predictable regulatory environment. So if you change the environment, that is to say you change the laws that were different from when an investment was made before a company was bought, before a farm was bought, before a factory was bought, and then you change the laws, well, that's, that upsets the environment. And so you can make an argument that any significant legislative change violates the investment agreements and the government must pay the investor before it can regulate that investment within the law. So that contrast that stable and predictable regulatory environment, which you might think is generally a good idea, but it requires government to pay an investor who who can basically claim the laws changed since I bought my bought my investment with the really broad standard of deference under U.S. constitutional law. It's a major shift. So, so, yeah, so, so are you saying that any law that we might pass here in Maine, environmental or whatever, um, that gets in the way of a multinational corporation's um, capacity to engage in free and unfettered trade in the state could be challenged? Probably an overstatement. Any law that interferes with their operations? No, it's probably an overstatement. It, when you get into the weeds, there are all kinds of details. For example, on the rule I just gave you, fair and equitable treatment. In its most recent agreements, the United States and Australia and New Zealand, in their own ways, have tried to tighten that uh, to a great extent. But there's still pushback and debate by lawyers who represent the investors. So that's now been defined in such a way that there's a burden on the investor to prove that there's a there's a consistent international practice that other countries engage in um, that's being violated. So it, it's evolving quickly. And it, so while I can say that there's a trend in turn, there's a general um, a set of rules that are very different from US constitutional law, as we speak, those rules are being debated and renegotiated in the TPPA and elsewhere. So it's a moving target. Are you saying that if a dispute arises, um, that that the dispute would not be settled in our court of law, that it would be um, it would be settled in an in international tribunal? Yeah, I'm definitely saying that. If it's a trade case brought under WTO rules, it'll be decided in Geneva in one of the dispute panels, and there's an appellate body at the WTO that reviews all their decisions. And while they don't have a rule of precedent like our courts do, the appellate body of the WTO works very hard to herd the cats and to keep their panels moving in, the, in a consistent direction. And they frequently edit the decisions coming out, <coughs> excuse me, coming out of their panels. If it comes under a free trade agreement, it will be decided by a different kind of dispute panel organized under that agreement. If it's an investment dispute, it will be decided by usually a three-person panel of arbitrators who are selected under the rules that have been adopted. Usually, the, there's a set of World Bank rules and a set of UN rules, um, which govern the, the way these panels operate. And so, in the, and the interesting thing I, about that is that many of the lawyers who sit on these investment tribunals will go from their law practice, where they represent investors or governments, to be on a decision-making panel, and then back to their law practice. So. It's kind of hard to imagine that people can keep those two girls separate without having an absurd conflict of interest. And so can you give us an example of the kind of law that could be passed here in Maine that could be challenged? And you adopt a combination of things, uh, such as Norway has just done. You say that you can no longer show your tobacco products in the store at all. No displays, no products on the shelf. In fact, you can't, <coughs> you can't even go ask for the product by name, you go to the counter and you get a little card and then you take that to a dispensing machine and it's all set up so that we can kind of track which products are sold and how. And on top of that, you increase the cigarette tax by 100%. And on top of that, um, you adopt public education measures that requires the clerk to read 
the disclosure to the person buying the tobacco, and on top of that, you adopt criminal penalties for anybody that sells the product to a kid. You get the point. You really adopt a battery of things that other countries and or other states are actually adopting, measures like that. Now comes the tobacco company and says, well, you just signed the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and in the intellectual property chapter, it says, I have a right to market my product. As long as I call, use a certain kind of name, um, I have a right to use my trademark and to market my product. That trademark is my intellectual property. If you just took it, consumers can no longer tell the difference between my brand and somebody else's brand in the store because it's, there's nothing to compare. There's nothing to look at. There's no shopping going on. You're forcing consumers to somehow decide what brand they're going to buy before they walk into the store. So you've taken away shopping. You've, you've covered up my brand. Oh, and by the way, when you add that on top of the federal regulations that require there to be an ugly picture on the package, something related to death or disease of smoking, you add it all up and it's, it's an expropriation. And as evidence to support that, I'm citing the TPPA's intellectual property chapter, um, as well as a bunch of uh, investment tribunal decisions from South America. So that's a scenario for how this stuff happens. Does that make sense? That's, a, that's an approximation of two cases that are going on right now. <clears throat> there are nine TPPA countries right now, but uh, the expectation is that most, if not all, of the 22 members of ASEAN, the Asia Pacific Economic Union, uh, will eventually join. And that includes some big economies like Japan and um, Korea may join it, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia. Indonesia, by the way, just successfully brought a complaint against the United States and the WTO over discriminatory tobacco legislation. So um, that's the point at which the TPPA becomes bigger than the European Union. So just to summarize the point I made earlier, the TPPA is very important because it represents a shift away from the WTO as a negotiating forum because it could be actually bigger than the European Union, and because the EU is not part of the negotiations. Any questions about the geography of these agreements? Has the, has the European Union sought access to the TPPA? <laughs> no, uh, not that I've heard. I, I'm sure they wouldn't be given access. Doesn't mean they wouldn't ask for it, however. <laughs> no, but I, I'm morally certain they wouldn't be. The countries that have asked for access include Canada and Mexico. Now, the countries that are interested because they can't stand the idea of not being part of something that's going to affect them includes China, um, Japan, and Korea. And two weeks ago, uh, US, the US Trade Ambassador, Ron Kirk, said that um, he looks forward to the day when China can join the TPPA. So that's, that's part of the roadmap to coming up with a, a bigger trading block that's not the WTO. Uh, let me move ahead. So <clears throat> let me summarize a few things I've said. Uh, a trade agreement is actually several things. I think there are four parts to keep in mind. Uh, part number one, obviously, is that there are trade rules. And like I said before, there are trade rules that actually regulate trade, mostly by lowering, lowering the ceiling on tariffs you can charge. But there are also trade rules that have to do with government power some of those are about non-discrimination, but also some of those are about are absolute rules. They're rules that limit how governments can operate even when they're not discriminating against goods or services or investors from another country. Secondly, a trade agreement provides dispute resolution, and investment agreements in particular provide dispute resolution that private companies can take advantage of and thereby avoid your domestic courts. Thirdly, it's a negotiating forum. Take the WTO, for example. The Uruguay round was done in 1994. The agreement took effect in 95, and they're still negotiating. There are forums within the WTO to continue negotiating trade agreements that are either amending existing agreements, like procurement, or to keep adding rules, which effectively are amendments, um, to important agreements such as services, including procurement of services. So they are an ongoing forum for negotiations, which therefore requires, I think constitutionally, ongoing oversight, legislative oversight, by, hopefully by Congress and in the absence of congressional oversight by you.
And finally, it's a framework com for compliance. There are all kinds of rules as part of trade agreements that require countries to notify each other of laws they pass. Um, the agreement on technical barriers to trade requires the United States government to notify the WTO, and thereby all 155 members of the WTO, um, any, any regulation that for which compliance is mandatory. And through an act of creative lawyering, they've decided that that is not being legislation. It only means agency rules. So when you adopt a law, it's not sent to the WTO. But as soon as your agency implements the rules to implement your law, that, is, that notice is given to the WTO. The locally famous example was when Senator Jenny Lyons of Vermont introduced a piece of legislation that regulated the recycling of uh, electronic products that are toxic in a landfill. Uh, she used a European model for her legislation and that was notified to the WTO and about six weeks later she got a piece of personal correspondence from Beijing expressing great interest in her bill and wanting more information about it. So that's, that's exactly how the system is designed to work but after that happened USTR decided that they didn't want state legislators to be rung up by Beijing. So uh, they took legislation off the list, and now it only works at the agency level. I'd like to welcome you all back. Uh, we had a little audio problem. Uh, we're ready to start. We still have some slight problem on one side of, of the horseshoe, but we will share the microphones. So thank you very much. And if everybody could have their seats. And Professor, you can proceed. I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about how trade agreements work. So. Um, Let's start with a quick review of which kinds of agreements most directly affect American states, the ones that affect your job description as a commission. Um, so you can think of it as several different kinds of agreements like we just summarized, each of which contains a different set of rules. The rules that tend to affect state and local governments the most include those that affect regulation of goods, regulation of services, procurement, subsidies and investment. Investment meaning ownership of land, ownership of, of a factory, ownership of a company. So the WTO family of agreements covers all of these categories, goods, services, procurement, subsidies, but not investment. Free trade agreements of the United States cover goods, services, and procurement and investment, giving foreign investors, Americans abroad, foreign companies here uh, greater rights than their domestic counterparts, but not subsidies. The reason for that is that it's hard to come up with limits on subsidies unless they're effectively global. If you think about how it might work in this region, if Maine adopts limits on subsidies, but New York decides they want to compete with you for jobs and they start subsidizing investments, um, your law is for naught. You have to have pretty much everybody on board for subsidy rules. In bilateral investment treaties, none of, this, none of the trade rules apply, but there are investment protection rules and a procedure for investors to, uh, to litigate those rules. So that's the big picture. These are the rules that apply. And what you can see from the chart I just, just displayed is that there's overlap. Some rules are covered by both free trade agreements and WTO agreements. And that's by design. It creates a certain kind of redundancy. It also means that there is an evolution as each successive trade agreement is negotiated. What it's doing is adding an opportunity to innovate, to make the rule stronger or tougher, or to make the rule more careful. Or in some cases, um, U.S. trade negotiators have listened to you and they've put in safeguards for legislation at the state level as well as the congressional level. Uh, I'm giving you a list now of uh, different kinds of state regulatory authority uh, that illustrate that what we used to think of as local is now global. And these are all um, areas of regulation that are covered by both trade agreements on services, 
and international investment agreements. It's an A to Z list. I won't read it all. You can see it, starting with alcohol and broadband and electricity, ending up with tobacco, water, and zoning. And it's just a representative list that you can probably know from your personal experience, things that I've left out. <clears throat> so uh, here are a few categories that have been the subject of foreign investment disputes. Hazardous waste. Gasoline additive. There have been several cases involving gasoline additives. Mining reclamation. Uh, the tobacco settlement, which was actually the uh, uh, a movement of tobacco litigation that was settled on behalf of 46 states by state attorneys general. Water resources. So a lot of these are things that are actually provided by or regulated by state and local governments, and yet they are now international in the sense that the companies who are providing an effective good or service are international companies. They're either a foreign firm crossing a border to provide a service, for example, the Canadian tribal corporations that were selling cigarettes in the United States, or it might be a French-owned conglomerate that has an American subsidiary that provides municipal water services. That makes it international for purposes of both the services agreement and for purposes of an international investment agreement. Even though the service is completely contained by your county, it's international because of who owns the company. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, areas of services that are now part of WTO negotiations to expand U.S. commitments to follow trade rules. Electricity regulation, gasoline additives, higher education, renewable energy. So my point is that what we used to think of as a local economy and local laws or state laws is now international simply because of the nature of the companies that are doing business within your jurisdiction. So how are the trade rules enforced? Well, not through WTO police. There's no I think it's, um, I've heard a lot of people say from time to time that a trade rule prohibits you from doing something or it takes away your authority to adopt certain kinds of legislation. That is not the case. There's no enforcement mechanism anywhere that I'm aware of that would keep you from adopting any law you want, even a law that explicitly violates a trade rule. So that's unaffected. You're not going to be hauled off by WTO police if you, uh, adopt a law that you know violates WTO rules. <clears throat> so how does it work? Well, through a system of economic shock. And uh, I found this picture, which I think is fortunate in several respects, uh, conveys a st strike of lightning hitting near but not on a state capital. I believe this is Texas, but I'm not sure. So uh, there are several things about this picture that help me explain to you how trade sanctions work. This is, in fact, the legal enforcement mechanism of trade rules. So first of all, it makes possible the threat of trade sanctions. So that what, what is likely to happen is, uh, as you're debating a law that might violate a trade rule, a lobbyist will come up to you and say, you shouldn't adopt that because if you do, it'll lead to a trade dispute. Well, <clears throat> what does that entail? Well, it entails a country having to go through the whole process of litigating a claim, which takes years. And then if they win the claim, it allows their country to identify goods or services from the United States on which they impose punitive tariffs. That's the lightning. Notice that the lightning is hitting the building next to the Capitol. What that symbolizes is that governments don't, except for the investment claims, in a trade dispute, governments don't pay a price directly. There's no sanction on you as a legislator. There's no sanction on the government of Maine for adopting a law that might violate a trade rule. Rather, what would happen is if the United States loses a case, based on a main law, let's say the European Union brought the case, they would target pieces of the American economy to apply their punitive sanctions to. It's called a carousel. They pick a revolving set of companies or sectors and apply usually 100% punitive tariffs to create economic pain. So the theory goes that the companies who, are, who endure that pain would lobby their members of Congress, who would then in turn lobby the U.S. Trade Representative or the President to do something about it, and the federal government would figure out how to put pressure on Maine to revise the law in a way that uh, um, the WTO party wants to see revised. So you see it's kind of an indirect process 
that ultimately uh, links it up with lobbying. In the case of investor compensation, investment rules as opposed to trade rules, the economic shock is payment of damages, <clears throat> more appropriately described as economic compensation for the cost to the, the losses of the investor, and um, this compensation would be paid by a government. For a government the size of the United States, and by the way, it's the United States that would pay such a claim, not the state of Maine. The United States, even if it's a Maine law, it's the United States and the United States Treasury. In fact, there's a judgment fund already set up for payment of any kind of legal claim of the United States of America, which would automatically kick into effect. And it's a big fund. It would take a, a humongous case to put much of a dent in the federal government. Um, so for the United States, it's not such a big deal to lose an investment claim. For a smaller country like Uruguay or Colombia, it might be a very big deal. Uh, and then, as I alluded earlier, that there's a political use of trade rules, which uh, looks more like lobbying. And what changes in the context of trade agreements is that the lobbyists start to change. You're used to being lobbied by representatives of companies who are affected by trade rules. Or citizen groups or consumers who wanted the benefits of protective regulation. Uh, if you encroach on trade rules, you might be lobbied by a, uh, an official of the U.S. federal government who comes in and tries to explain to you how things work and what risk you're putting the United States at. Or it might be a foreign government. I know state legislators in California who've gotten surprise visits by representatives of the European Commission. Or you might be lobbied by private law firms that represent governments. So it's changing the lobbying game. Um, the lobbyists are going to make economic arguments, but they'll also make legal arguments. And that's why it's helpful for you to understand how the trade rules actually work, because some legal arguments, as you well know, are bullshit, and some are actually accurate. How do you tell the difference when somebody with two law degrees is, sit is sitting in front of you in an expensive suit saying, this is the law? Maybe. I think it's about 600, and they're described as lean and mean by comparison to other federal agencies. This is lean and mean. <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, I've seen, I was in Dallas a few weeks ago at the negotiations, and there are USTR people swarming all over all the meetings of the TPPA negotiating groups. And, uh, you know, so for, for, for every single negotiator from Malaysia, there are four or five USTR people. And that's not counting the lobbyists that are feeding USTR with lots of analysis. There are 800 some odd people on the technical advisory committees feeding into USTR. And that's only a symbol. I mean, it's probably a much greater number in terms of all the corporate interests that are feeding in. And the advisory committees don't capture the lobbying they're getting from civil society that's not part of the committee system. So they're add a few more hundred people on that side of the fence. USTR is like sitting on this huge mountain of information. I don't think they do too much research. That's because they have so much to sift through. So um, that's why I think the role you play is so influential. You may just be little mean, but that's exactly why people care about what you have to say. Uh, so let me conclude my introductory comments, which have gone on for a bit longer than I thought. Uh, with just a couple themes, because we're going to go into the weeds in three subjects you asked me to look at more carefully, and I'll give you what I think are some of the interesting themes about each subject. Um, yes? So we're going to talk about tobacco first. I, I put it first just because it's a bit more technical than some of the other. To say it's more technical than pharmaceuticals is pushing it, but um, tobacco is where the, there's a a red-hot fight right now. And the theme I'd like to leave you with is that there are competing frameworks. What's especially interesting about tobacco is that you've got the TPPA, which is a framework of trade rules covering 20-some-odd chapters. And you can match it up against the world's first global treaty on health, which actually has more members than the World Trade Organization. There are 174 parties to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, by comparison, 155 in the World Trade Organization. And for every piece of the tobacco framework where the convention is calling upon governments to adopt restrictions on tobacco trade, there's a piece of the trade agreement that could block it. I'm not saying does block it. I'm not saying will block it. I'm saying could block it. 
So lining up these two competing frameworks is fascinating from a legal point of view and from a real political point of view. It's, it's like a very important fight that's now happened. If you understand that fight, you can have an impact and I would suggest a lot of fun. It's really, it's really interesting. Pharmaceuticals. What's interesting about this is, likewise, a contest between two dominant players. On the one hand, you have the, the industry that makes life-saving drugs and health-enhancing drugs, represented by Pharma, the trade association. Very powerful lobby in Washington and a very effective lobby globally. And obviously, pharma is all about using the market power they create by the value of the drugs that they manufacture and their ability to market those drugs to you, the consumer, either directly or through your doctor or through your health plan or through the people that pay for your health plan. I dare say they spend about as much on marketing as they do on actual research. I think more, actually, now that I recall. On the other hand, you have another market player, the United States government and within your own local market, the state of Maine. Each of these two dominant market players wants to use its market power, in the case of the pharmaceutical companies, to maximize their income from the drugs that they manufacture, and in the case of government, to manage what has become the fastest rising cost within the health sector, which is the, <laughs> the fastest growing sector of expenses for state and local government. So we'll return to this, but what the, what the struggle is really about is who gets to define market power and take advantage of it. And the final theme is for procurement, and this was a hard choice, but the one that I selected to call to your attention to is the apparent desire by U.S. trade negotiators to avoid congressional oversight. I think for the reasons that I suggested earlier, that it's, it's a bit painful to do so, but every time they go back to Congress, at the very least, it chews up a great deal of their time and resources and exposes them to political risks they'd rather not manage. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my overview, see if you have any more general questions, and then